Please welcome Dr. Burkhooks to the stage. So thanks very much for coming. Thanks for the organizers for, for having all of us. I was a little bit concerned at the outset of this that I was going to be Debbie Downer at the end. But <laughs> given the last topic, I feel like I'll have to be a ray of sunshine. But even, even thinking about that, when I started looking at what I could talk about uh, for this presentation, uh, the honest truth is this is where, well, that was the introductory slide. This is where my mind went. Because as most of my friends know, I do, in fact, have a real uh, and very pressing fear of the coming zombie apocalypse. But even when I got past that, I'm not joking about that, by the way. Even when I got past that, I was really a little overwhelmed by what I could talk about. I, I thought about, as a professional practicing scientist, I could talk about the danger of underfunding science, or the danger of undermining science and public discourse relative to opinion. And I decided that it wasn't fair for me to give a talk in which I simply pontificated to you about my views of science and danger without actually putting myself in danger. So what I'm going to do today is give a talk in which uh, I'll address a, what I would believe to be a contentious issue. I would imagine that many of you will not agree with me at the outset. Many of you may not agree at the conclusion of the talk, but I think it's an important topic to start discussing. What I want to talk about is the relationship between science and sport from a cultural perspective. So here are three images. This is Ricky Ponting, Eddie Jones, and Brad Green. And aside from being men and Australian and sports figures, does anybody know what the next thing is that they have in common? What was that? Not, not a bad guess. They were all fired for poor performance, all of them. They were all devo demoted. They were all sacked. And that's just part of competition in sport. We have no problem with that whatsoever. What I want to tell you about is that we shouldn't consider science and innovation to be that different from sport in this respect. That is, I want to tell you about the danger of being too fair in science, meaning the danger of removing competitiveness from science education and research. Right? Now, before anybody starts to get up and walk away, this is not going to be an Ayn Rand style rant. Don't worry about that. Uh, but I want to set the stage by explaining to you that science is an extremely competitive industry. We dedicate our lives to problems large and small, work extremely long hours. We compete all our lives for positions, for publications, not very much pay at the end of the day. And uh, uh, you know, this is all because of self-motivation. Right? There's, there's no real external incentive right now to do this. But this competitiveness is built in. In order to understand where the problems are arising, let's start with how we begin our careers as scientists. This is the awarding of the PhD. The PhD, if you're not familiar, is the terminal professional qualification for a practicing scientist. It takes something like five to six years to achieve a PhD in science. It's the median time internationally. And this degree signifies that you, as a scientist, have made a substantial contribution to research internationally, and you have gained true expertise in a discipline. But in addition to showing your qualities, the awarding of the PhD reflects back on the institution that grants it more than almost anything else. The quality of PhD recipients reflects on the quality of the granting body, again, more than almost anything else. Now for context, let me show you the kind of work that I do in my lab. This is an uh, optical photograph, although it's obviously magnified, of a crystal of trapped ions. We use, each blue dot is one atom of beryllium. We use lasers and microwave systems in order to control trapped atoms uh, for the development of new technology. And the kinds of things that we're working on really have the potential for some profound social and economic impacts. There was a paper we published in uh, Nature earlier this year that if, it comes to, if the technology develops to fruition, actually has the potential to totally revolutionize the way we do computation. At least that's what we hope. Maybe it won't. Now, unfortunately, this work is really not easy. This is a picture of the lab in which I used to work uh, at NIST in Boulder. And it's a nice one just because somebody framed it well. Uh, people who are pursuing degrees, in working in my lab or other labs like mine, require a detailed knowledge of basic physics, of laser physics, atomic physics, quantum physics, optics, optoelectronics, electronics, data acquisition, computer science, even heating, uh, heating ventilation and air conditioning to make sure that the labs function for us. Mastering all of this is a really big ask for our students. But it's just what's required to work in this room. 
There's no, no two ways about it. Now, unfortunately, there's a really perverse set of incentives for universities right now that discourages competitiveness. And the worst among these is the fact that when we look at the PhD programs, there's a financial incentive for Australian PhD granting bodies to give the degree as quickly as possible. Right? There are financial penalties if the candidature exceeds significantly three years. And remember, the international norm is about six. This is dangerous to us, to our society, from an international competitive picture. Now, the danger continues from there. Once awarded, there are growing calls from unions uh, and others that PhD recipients should immediately be placed into permanent positions with guaranteed job security for life. Now, this is very different from considerations of tenure, where uh, people compete for many years and very few academics ultimately achieve tenure. Right? The diminishment of competitiveness in this process is actually systematically entrenched, and we see this in enterprise bargaining agreements that favor local candidates over international candidates, regardless of merit, and prevent or try to prevent redundancies, no matter how sustained or how serious an individual's underperformance is. So the question is, why is this happening in Australia? First, I think there's a cultural perspective, and this is a, a misapplication, a twisting of this incredibly important idea of a fair go in Australia. This is so fundamental to Australian society, and it's actually a big part of why I was uh, happy to move here from the United States, where a fair go is not uh, given to many, if, uh, if any. So unfortunately, that twisting of this idea has led to a situation where it's impossible to use professional judgment in evaluating the quality of our colleagues. And that's kind of the basis of how science works. It's all about peer review. This idea of fairness has turned into a different idea of entitlement. Now, in addition to this national cultural perspective, there is what I consider to be a generational perspective. Uh, we have this notion that we're all so special, right? This is, this is typified in many, in many places. We were coming shockingly narcissistic and uh, I, I believe this is fed in part by social media. There's nothing wrong with social media per se, but this idea of uh, narcissism is really being fed by this. Anytime something goes wrong, it must be because the system is biased against me. We can't deal with being told we're imperfect. Anytime someone tells us we're imperfect, we get very upset, and often in many famous cases, we demand legal action for redressing that. In the context of sports, this would just never fly. You can think you're the best footballer in the world, but you miss one too many open field tackles and you're back in the second grades, right? This is really a dangerous situation in my perspective as a professional scientist. The government, our society, has recognized the importance of science but we're, and, and is trying to build up the enterprise, but we're failing to simultaneously ensure that quality standards are maintained, that we're granting more PhDs and they're all to excellent candidates. Now, fortunately, it doesn't need to be this way, and that's because Australians do not uniformly reject the notion of competition and excellence. We accept them as virtuous in the context of sports. So just look at the recent outrage uh, at the Olympics of the relatively small number of gold medals that were achieved, right? We can be fair and we can obey the rules, but we can still play to win. So what I want to convince you is that we should carry this notion, this spirit over to science, where the whole discipline and all of society would benefit from increased competition among students, recognition for top performers, and enhanced opportunity for underrepresented groups in the discipline. Now, with this talk, I simply hope that changing your mind will be a first step towards modifying the way our society views, supports, and nurtures science uh, in our society. Thank you very much. How many, of you, how many of you fundamentally reject the idea that I just described? All right.